such as the Sands of Iwo Jima and Flying Leathernecks. And uh, Hollywood's done a real good job portraying the Marines. They have a good reputation. And uh, I like that. I like the image that the Marine Corps represented. When I was looking into the services, people said, you don't want to go to the Marine Corps. They have a 13-week uh, boot camp. The other services are eight weeks or six weeks. It's, it's a lot easier. And uh, personally, I, I wanted to choose a hard route. I wanted to challenge myself. And uh, I'm really glad I did. It's a, uh, it's a great service my opinion, the best service. The Marine Corps offers its warriors many challenges. None, however, can compare with that of flying the AH-1 Cobra attack helicopter. I'm a Cobra pilot, a Cobra attack helicopter pilot. Flying the Cobra, Captain Mike Rocco's single mission is... To destroy the enemy. That's our sole purpose in life, is to support the grunts, support the guy on the ground, and destroy the enemy. Once on the ground, a team of Cobras hovering above means victory. First Lieutenant George Calkins describes flying in the Cobra as phenomenal. Flying is pretty much like riding a motorcycle in three dimensions. Uh, get down really low is the safest place for us, but also the most exciting flying. You do get the feeling of speed when it goes fast as the fast motors, but uh, you know, cruising along the desert pretty low. <laughs> it's terrific. Uh, best ride in the desert. forms an inhospitable wasteland into a high-tech mobile combat operations base. From the EAF, Cobra pilots strike hard. Their talent and skill of the air must be matched by an equally worthy weapon, such as the AH-1 Cobra. The Cobra itself is the most maneuverable aircraft on the battlefield today. Uh, we compare, we're compared a lot to the Apache, and the Apache is a fine aircraft. Um, fortunately, the Apache costs about twice as much as a Cobra and the Marine Corps will give you more bang for the bucks. You know, we take very little of the military budget to provide a lot of the firepower, and the whiskey is a prime example of that. The bang for the bucks is a thundering tribute to the specialized training of Cobra pilots. The Cobra has two pilots, and they're fairly interchangeable, but, I mean, as far as the talents each guy has, uh, but the requirements, depending on which seat, are very different. Usually, you'll set it up that the guy in the back seat will be controlling the flight and how it's going, and actually controlling the aircraft, whereas the guy in the front seat will be doing most of the navigation, sort of keeping a lookout because he does have a better view in the front seat, but primarily he'll be handling the weapons. Um, his big job is uh, the tow missile, and he's got the best view through the telescoping sight unit. If you want to shoot the gun, you can be much more accurate with a 13 power scope um, to get the 20 millimeter rounds in, or the tow missile, or Hellfire, or uh, the rockets we carry. A dozen Cobras, Hueys, their pilots, and support personnel comprise a Marine Light Attack Helicopter Squadron, or HMLA. Codename Scarface is HMLA-367. Scarface, HMLA-367, uh, it's been around since uh, just after World War II. Um, had a distinguished history from dating back then when it was a VMO squadron, observation squadron. It was also a squadron that was active during the Vietnam War. The maneuverability of the helicopter led to its development as a weapon-carrying platform, and to this end, early choppers in Vietnam were hastily fitted for combat. The Marines started flying Huey Cobras in 1969. They immediately saw their battle successes increase and losses decrease. Soon, no Helleborn operation would choose to be without an AH-1G Huey Cobra as their escort.
Cobras would typically escort troop-carrying Hueys and observation Kiowas into a landing zone. Once there, each would do its job to secure the area. The Viet Cong tried their best to avoid open confrontation with air mobile forces. The Hueys, Kiowas, and Cobras formed a perfect partnership. Working in tandem, they would pull off one successful operation after another. There was no crucial battle throughout South Vietnam in which air mobility did not play a part. Thank <laughs> you. 
After successfully securing the area, the Kiowas would spot the pickup zone for the victorious troops. the attack helicopter was to prove itself on was the Caribbean island of Grenada. Communist units from Cuba had overthrown the government and held U.S. citizens hostage. New Army UH-60 Black Hawk transports were to see action alongside updated Marine twin-engine Hueys. CH-46s carried heavy troop and cargo loads to the front. These sea-launched assaults provided a safe island landing for ground personnel. Supplied BTR 60 armored personnel carriers were choice Super Cobra targets. Only minimum helicopter losses were suffered in the fight for the island's liberation. The biggest asset is its engines. It, uh... It has some great uh, T-700 power plants, provides plenty of power for the airframe. Twin General Electric T-700 turbine engines give the Cobra nearly unlimited combat versatility. These power plants allow pilots to hover below enemy radar, thus enabling them to select, arm up, and fire their choice of weapons from a concealed position. was an international hotspot. Marine Cobras and their pilots, along with a multinational naval force, were tasked to defend all nations' right of free passage. The Iran-Iraq war had raged for years, and now Iran had threatened Iraq's ally, Kuwait, with the destruction of their oil tankers. Quickly reflagged, the tankers became targets for Iranian speedboat attacks. Okay, I'm, uh, we got a high-speed boat coming in on the starboard side. I just missed that information for all the Iranian mine layers dumped countless anti-ship mines throughout the Gulf. These mines damaged several tankers and Navy ships. In retaliation, Marine Cobra pilots were given the order to attack and disable Iranian-held Siri and Sassan oil platforms. These rigs had been the base of operation for the Iranian speedboats. Navy warship. You 
have five minutes to evacuate your platform. Any actions other than evacuation will result in immediate destruction. The Iranians wanted to play hardball. They ignored the evacuation orders and fired on nearby U.S. warships. The Cobras went to work. Their pilots zeroed in on the oil platforms and fired their devastating okay. tow missiles and 20-millimeter cannons. Keeping the crosshairs in the target box, the pilots guided the tows to the most vulnerable parts of the oil platforms, ensuring maximum destruction. Be aware that on platform three, the building is experiencing secondaries at this time. I'm on target. Wire gold is eagle. Uh, the, the ball game is yours. No shoot. You yeah. bears 219, 14,900 yards. Bring him down, bring him down, bring him down. There you go. That's it. 447, can you mark him off that pack in? Check the other platforms. Shoot high on seven. Break seven. Following the Cobra attack on the oil platforms, CH-46 Sea Knights airlifted Marines to the crippled rigs. The grunts had a very clear objective, find Iranian survivors, if any, and evacuate them. Afterwards, the oil platforms were to be blown up. As the Marines fast roped into the burning inferno, Cobra pilots circled overhead, ready to lay down suppressive fire if necessary. The grunts set explosive charges, and the dangerous mopping up operation began. Iranian anti-aircraft artillery used against the Cobras lay abandoned on the platforms. Where further Iranian resistance was suspected, the Marines ended the dispute with hand grenades. During the nine-hour battle, the Iranians lost two oil platforms, a missile boat, three armed speedboats, and a frigate. A tragic price was paid by the Marines for their victory, however. One Cobra helicopter and its two-man crew never returned home. A combined arms exercise, or CACS, as conducted in 29 Palms, California, coordinates various air and land combat elements to fight as a single marine force. CACS will measure the skill and bravery of Cobra pilots under realistic wartime conditions. Yeah, 417 in flight, holding short hotel for takeoff, LG Red. Starbase 417 in flight, wind calm, cleared for takeoff. Roger, there for takeoff. Roger, controls. Before it can attack enemy targets, the Cobra's deadly array of weapons must be fully armed. Arming takes place at a safe landing zone known as LZ Red, where safety devices are removed by specialized ordnance personnel. The reason for this procedure is very simple. The awesome firepower of the Cobra, if unleashed accidentally, would result in enormous damage and loss of life at the EAF. The remoteness of LZ Red forestalls any possibility of disaster. Skyface 407 in flight, left turn off for LZ Red approved. Landing at LZ Red will be a pilot's on risk. Report lifting with intentions. LZ Red is half a mile away from the Marine Expeditionary Airfield. Fire missiles, along with the powerful 20-millimeter cannon, must be armed. An LZ Red Team captain oversees all preparations for making the inboard and outboard weapons battle ready. He instructs the Cobra pilots to keep their hands in the air and away from the weapons controls, while safety cutter pins are removed from the missiles, rockets, and cannon. The hands-off throttle and stick, or HOTS directive, is strictly enforced as the skilled ground crew arms the attack helicopter. Thumbs up are given to Cobra 1, and the team captain gives the go signal. 
Until Cobra II is fully armed, the team captain keeps his hands on his head. This tells the pilots that arming is still taking place and that the HOTS directive is still in force. Though the Cobra pilots are anxious to begin the hunt for enemy targets, they realize that arming is a dangerous procedure that must be completed with the utmost care. Stressing teamwork, the pilots from Cobra 1 have waited for Cobra 2. After thumbs up and salutes are given, the two Cobras lift off together, now both fully armed and ready for battle. The amazing view from the Cobra cockpits allows the pilot and co-pilot to see in all directions as they cruise at only 50 feet above the desert floor. The pilots maintain that the thrill of flying in the Cobra is more like wearing it than riding in it. Suspended between sky and ground in a body-hugging glass bubble, the sensation is described as nothing short of unearthly and even magical. But the intense level of training received by these pilots allows them to never be distracted from the deadly intent of their mission objectives, that of seeking out and destroying enemy targets. Three, seven, one, two, zero, zero. Two, four, zero, zero. Egress to the AP, then holding area by the east side of Hildago. Good copy. The Cobra pilots are in contact with a ground-based forward air controller, or FAC, who directs them to a holding area known as the Attack Position, or AP. Once the pilots have reached the AP, they communicate with the forward air controller for the exact target coordinates, and the co-pilot checks his 13-power TSU, or telescopic scope unit. The missiles are now armed and ready for attack. Just, just to the north side of that gorge, there's that ridge. Okay. And it, it's at the end of that ridge. Copy. Okay, he's going to shoot the toe here. Just kind of get off to the left here a little bit of him. Roger. Arm yourself, make sure you're selected. Roger. I don't know if it's just the impact from the force. Yeah, I, took it, I took it right through that black silhouette. Yeah, roger right that. It looks good from here. Tell him, Doug, what do we have? The toes found their targets. Cobra 1 veers off as Cobra 2 declares that it is armed up, on station, and looking for work. Tank crews and grunts anxiously wait for the Cobra pilots to destroy the worst of the bad guys. Once the Cobras have finished their job, the ground forces go in for mop-up. The forward air controller acquires new targets, and the Cobras turn the hell-blown desert into a dusty killing field.
dangerously low altitudes, sometimes no more than 50 feet from the ground, risk damage from lethal enemy anti-aircraft fire. Focused on diving and attacking with toes in the cabin, the crews have little time for fear. Okay, we're going to be coming in. Uh, Roger, we'll be in for me to re-attack. Again, be uh, probably you know, we got to hug the tree here and make a right-hand turn. The tone impacts have been devastating as have the soft target attacks by the 20mm cannon. The Cobra pilots perform flawlessly, and the Marine M60 tanks and armored personnel carriers press forward to complete their part in the CACs. The Cobra pilots note their kills and begin the journey back to the expeditionary airfield. effectiveness and ferocity of Scarface HMLA-367. Mission accomplished, they reflect on their performance, realizing that one day, all the practice and training they receive could be put to the ultimate test. Cobra pilots know that once they are in the heat of battle, it will be a kill or be killed scenario. Every second will count, and each decision they make will have to be perfect. Their trust in one another and their camaraderie will bond these pilots together forever. Do or die, Scarface HMLA-367 will be more than ready for the challenge of taking on any enemy, anywhere, anytime. In January 1991, the Marine Ground Forces and Cobra pilots positioned in northeastern Saudi Arabia endured an inhospitable environment, waiting for a chance to find Saddam Hussein and his combat-hardened troops. As the Gulf crisis intensified, Operation Desert Storm was launched with a massive air against Saddam's army throughout Iraq and occupied Kuwait. We knew what our mission was. We've been over there for seven months waiting for it to happen. And then uh, one day in the end of January, it finally happened. The first taste of combat was uh, during the Battle of Kafji. So we went up there to support the troops on the ground. The international forces that were in and around Kakhti and the Marine forces. Located two miles south of the Saudi-Kuwaiti border, the abandoned city of al Kafji appeared to be easy prey to an Iraqi armored column. They were proven wrong. Most of the action we had, we were actually engaging the enemy. It's up to the northwest of the city where the Iraqis had taken a police post right on the Kuwaiti-Saudi uh, border running operations out of that. One guy, as we call back, Ford Air Controller, in a Humvee, who was driving along the desert, a good couple of miles well ahead of uh, all the friendly troops. And we were the only ones up there, and this poor guy's the only one on the ground, just in his Humvee, and he had five uh, Cobras above him, escort. And moved up, got up towards the police post, saw a vehicle up there, and we've been told all, anything in that area was enemy. Um, got up there, and the vehicle started to move away. We saw it, locked onto it with a tow, I think it was a dash two, and uh, took a tow shot, flew that up with an ammunition truck, and went, went sky high. Once that went, you could see some of the other vehicles start moving, sort of behind it. They were uh, armored personnel carriers and self-propelled artillery pieces. And uh, from then on, it was, uh, you know, And uh, it was like listening to the radio it was just the chatter and you know, screaming, you know, hey, I got a target here, I got a target here, you're cleared hot, you're cleared hot. And uh, we were picking them off. for a bloody street battle. The Cobra pilots continued to rain hell down on the Iraqi military machine. In one day, 28 Iraqi tanks, armored personnel carriers, and fuel artillery platforms were blown out of existence by Scarface HMLA-367. Tow and Hellfire missiles ripped into Iraqi positions without mercy. The images of this battle will be indelibly etched in the memories of the Cobra pilots 
pilots who fought at Kachi. I'll never forget some of the attacks in and around Kachi when we rolled in on some targets. No, we destroyed no. some counter personnel okay. carriers, some BMPs. We destroyed an artillery battery, approximately 12 armored uh, personnel carriers with self propelled okay. artillery. Shot the targets with tow and hellfire missiles and watching um, these armored personnel carriers just envelop themselves in an orange ball of flame. Target heading 120. As a team, Cobra ground crew and pilots work together to meet any challenge and overcome all obstacles. Marines are a lead combat force and life's not necessarily the easiest. We end up taking a lot of knocks and frequently doing things the hard way. But uh, learn a lot and uh, haven't been sorry with my decision yet. Tougher training makes tougher warriors. The drive to be the best is in the heart of every Cobra pilot. I like to be getting hit somewhere else. I like to be aggressive man. in the Marine Corps. There's always a way to sell. There's always a way to demonstrate your knowledge, demonstrate your uh, tactical expertise, demonstrate your flying ability. To be a Marine Cobra pilot means more than just enjoying the thrill of flying. I think it's the finest, uh, finest flying you can do in the Marine Corps. Because you, you stay close to your ground brethren, and uh, you're a pilot, uh, and everyone who is a pilot enjoys to fly, enjoys the flying, and yet we still are close to our roots and the grunts. And uh, our main purpose is to support the guy on the ground, and that's the only reason why we're around here. It's to support the uh, Marine with the M16 on the ground. Whether in the skies of Vietnam, over the Persian Gulf, or hovering above the Arab desert, Cobra pilots are part of the Marine Corps' proud tradition of victory. Ranger! 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 Hardcore! 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 